Well, so, yeah. well, this is a good house. It's got a, a blue light instead of a red light. So. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're very fortunate to have Matt McLucky here to talk about his experience and share with you some tips. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Matt Lucky. Matt Lucky. Um, just giving us my background, I've been a software development manager and a director for many years, 25 years in software development and such. So I started as a developer way back when, a long time ago. I won't mention those dates now. Uh, and then uh, became a manager, uh, and then at one point a director, and then switched back and forth between those two titles a little, many times in my career all the time. So, um, and uh, one of the things that I really have a passion for is uh, for really helping the people become effective developers when they come on board a new company and such. I had an interesting experience when I came on board. I was tossed into an office and said, now go do, basically. And didn't really have much mentorship, didn't really have much uh, uh, people tell me how to do things or how to work in the, in the company and such. And so I kind of like to give people what more of an understanding of, okay, what they should expect when they go into that environment and such and how to get into that environment to start with. So let me go ahead and start with uh, one of the first things you should probably do. Um, well, for one thing, uh, you should actually apply to some place to work. I mean, it's an important step. Um, how hard to get a job otherwise. Um, but yeah, so so one of the things uh, when you're applying and such, um, I, one of the things I would always recommend people do is to show something beyond just coursework. Uh, yes, I like the fact that you've gone in and learned from an academic point of view, learned some theory, learned some computation, you learned some languages. But really, I want to see some passion. I want to see the fact that you actually like this field. Um, so some personal projects is, is a good thing to say. Like, I learned this on, on my own at some point. I tried this out. I created this mobile app. I created this web app. Um, I like to see someone who has a passion for the field, <coughs> not just for the sake of making a living, but also they like the field. They like doing this work and such. Um, so internships are a great way of getting that kind of that practical experience, but also just side projects. You know, just go on the web and learn something, basically. So. Uh, definitely have, have a good resume and such. Please spell check it. I cannot believe that I'm still in this day and age getting resumes that are poor grammar and poor spelling. Yes, it does matter. Yes, it does. Please, please. Um, make sure that the email address and the phone number that you have on your resume, you actually check regularly. That's kind of a frustration when you try to contact someone and never get a hold of them. So. Uh, and then, of course, uh, make sure you got the little buzzwords for those HR filters. Um, you, you guys should know by now that basically when it comes to resumes, I don't see them until HR gets filters them, basically. So if you haven't put on the buzzwords that say like Angular, for example, the things developers I'm looking for, or JavaScript or SQL or whatever else, they won't pass that filter. Even though you may have those experiences, you may say I do web development and database development, but never list those languages, it doesn't pass the filter. So be sure to put those buzzwords in still. So. Um, and also, uh, anything you put on your resume is fair game, by the way. So if you put a language on there, expect your interviewer to be able to ask questions about it as such. So don't put something on there if you're not ready to answer some questions about it. So, Okay, uh, one of the things that was interesting nowadays, of course, is the LinkedIn profiles. Um, I actually went to an interview not too long ago, and they didn't even bother to look at my resume. They just pulled up my LinkedIn profile and started asking me questions about it, basically. And so... Make sure those are if you have a LinkedIn profile. Make sure it's nice and clean. Uh, also, any public profiles you uh, on Facebook or anything else. Make sure it's nice and clean, just in case. Uh, purchase a nice set of interviewing clothes. Yes, in my work environment, I don't dress like this. I wear, I wear jeans and uh, I wear a college shirt. But most of my guys don't. My guys don't and such. Um, but during the interview process, we do expect you to kind of be one level above and such. So whenever you interview someplace, just make sure you're at least one level above your interviewer, basically. So if they're in jeans and a t-shirt, wear a college shirt. If, you're, if they're a college shirt type of person, then make sure you're wearing a suit and tie type of person, please. Um, so do your salary research. Uh, this is an important one. So one thing that's frustrating when... Uh, getting a new person right out of school and such is they sometimes have no concept of what a salary is. And the HR person is going to ask that salary probably before I get a chance to talk to them about salaries and such. And so when they come in and they say a really low one and they're really out of the park and then later on I want to offer them a higher salary, that doesn't work out so well and such. So kind of know which, what we get paid for in this market and such. Do some research. Make sure you know a number and what you're going for. Um, some of the things about picking the right company. Um, 
one of the things I, I worry about, uh, kind of avoid the lure of uh, academia. Um, so if you get done with a program somewhere at a university or somewhere else, there might be this position open in the place where you just got your degree from and such. Yeah, it's kind of nice. It's kind of low, you know, low effort to get the job and such. But you really should go find a good software development shop to get your, your real credentials uh, at this point and such. Yet you're not going to be viewed as highly if you don't have that, that rubber stamp from a big name, bigger name company, basically. Okay. Um, definitely choose a software development shop, not an IT shop, as your first job and such. Um, software development shops where they focus on what they're creating is what they sell is, is going to be a much better experience for you than a place where you're viewed as an expense. So you're an asset, not an expense. Because in an IT shop, they want to reduce those costs as much as possible, reduce the amount of training, reduce the amount of everything, basically. They're not looking towards growing you as a resource as much. A software development shop, they view you as an asset to be grown and to, to be a developer. Plus, the fact their practices are much better in terms of they're geared towards creating long-term software that will last years and years, not just something quickly can be done in a project cycle, essentially. So definitely look for a software development shop more so than an IT shop as your first job. I'm not saying not later in your career you might go that direction, but in that first experience you want to get to those good practices that a good software shop will give you, basically. I'll look for one that's large enough to have multiple teams. Uh, you will learn somewhat by being honest, but one team of developers and working on a project. But if you have to work with cross teams, you'll learn a lot more about how to work together and such, a lot more about continuous integration. Um, with ser connection servers, uh, we're working more with other teams, having to go ahead and check in code, and work with other people's deployments and such, you'll learn a lot more, trust me. Um, definitely a good name is always important. Make sure it's stable, make sure there's money in the bank, good long-term prospects. Um, definitely you can go ahead and look into some of this information on Glassdoor. Anyone you know, look at those Glassdoor reviews? Everyone do that? Okay, good. Uh, it's a good way of getting some really honest information on this. Always put always a grain of salt. There's always an employee that, that left and just felt bad about that company and whatever else. So look across multiple of those reviews, but it's a good place to get some feedback. All right. Uh, one of the important things when you're interviewing, uh, it's kind of funny that uh, people are someone scared to interview when they go into an interview with a, a company and such, <coughs> because the people who are interviewing you are desperate to hire you. They're not looking to exclude you. They want you to actually succeed during the interview, basically. Because basically by the time a manager has got approval to go ahead and hire someone, it's past the point they need it. They, they are desperate to find someone to fill that spot. And quite frankly, their job is not about hiring all the time. Their job is about doing a lot of other things. And so the sooner they fill that position, the better off things are and such. So uh, they're gonna look for every opportunity to go ahead and give you the benefit of the doubt. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, recruiters are the same way. Recruiters, uh, recruiters are interesting. Um, they're somewhat salespeople and such, so always take their, what recruiters say with a, a grain of salt and such. They're trying to sell you on the company and whatever else. Um, but they're also desperate to fill positions. They've got a certain headcount they're trying to hit and such, and so they're also looking to hire you as well and such. So all you really need for the recruiters is get those right buzzwords and make sure you're polite on the phone call and you'll likely get to the next stage, basically. So <coughs> uh, managers, uh, manager interviews are not that hard, I have to be totally honest and such. Managers typically know less than their developers that are working for them. I can, I can honestly say that. <laughs> My developers know a lot more than I do about development at this point. Um, so, so all the manager's looking for is someone with a good work ethic, someone who's willing to, to do a good job and such. You got the basics of skills because we'll be able to ask questions about the basics and such. Um, and that uh, you can kind of, kind of we'll, we'll, are someone who wants to work for us, basically. You're not just doing this job because it's your only option and such. You actually care about this job in some way or fashion. So yes, research the company before you go interview. It lets, it lets them know that you have some desire to work for them beyond just the money. <coughs> Uh, yeah, obviously one of the things that I, I'm careful of is always be positive in interviews. People like positive people. Uh, yes, I'd love to say we're all logical types that will go ahead and, and evaluate you on your skills regardless of how you interact with us. But no, if you're a positive person, you're someone who's trying to move, move things forward, do your best, be, be your best answer, whatever else. Uh, you don't badmouth your former employer, employers. That's a real negative and such for me because I don't want to go ahead and hire someone who's going to badmouth my company after they leave, they leave me and such. So always be positive. 
And let's be honest, though. So, like, if mm -hmm. I had a situation where I had some negative things about the previous company and the reason why I mm -hmm. left it and such, I wouldn't, wouldn't shy away from it. If they literally asked me what was some negative things about your previous corner, I would just put it in a positive spin and see how I was proactively dealt with it. Let's say my manager was very, very busy, for example, and he wasn't had time for me. Well, I won't phrase it that way. I was just to say, you know, um, my manager was busy, but what I was able to do was go ahead and work with those, my peers, and kind of learn things on my own and, and approach this problem to get around that. Always how did I make it to a positive? How does this reflect positively on me and the fact that I'm complaining about this one piece and such? Okay. Uh, yeah, be honest about not knowing anything. Yes, you won't know something. Uh, often we'll ask you questions specifically to find out where you don't know something or where you're willing to say you don't know something and such. Uh, we want you to be self-aware. If you're not self-aware, I can't teach you what you don't know because you don't know you don't know it. Does that make sense? So don't be honest about not knowing something. But don't just say, no, I don't know. Say, huh, I don't know something about that, but I have some ideas. Is this something <laughs> that you're talking about? Is this kind of what you're after and such? I'll ask for clarification. Okay, what does that really mean and such? And then when they give the explanation, you can extend on that knowledge essentially and show them that, yes, you are someone that thinks. You're not someone that just stops with a, a no. I'm actually someone who tries to, to figure some things out for myself. Does that make sense? All right. All right. Uh, take your time. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, there's what, I don't know about you, but for me, I love to respond immediately when someone asks me a question. I love having that answer right off the tip of my tongue. That's not usually the best tactic to take during an interview. You just want to think through your answers and how they'll be interpreted, basically. So you got plenty of time. Just go ahead and think through your answer. Take your time. Take a breath. And then respond. Uh, don't immediately just put up the first thing you think of. So... Uh, be sure to ask questions of every interviewer. Um, there's no reason to not have a question for, a, for an interviewer and such. If nothing else, you ask that interviewer's own experience and such. So why do you like the company? Uh, what have you been doing in this company for the last few years? So why do you stay with this company? Um, all sorts of questions you can ask about their individual experience. Uh, they'll show that you have an interest in the company. And you can always ask it with every interviewer. You won't get the same answer with twice, essentially. Uh, remember that you're also supposed to be evaluating the company. Um, you're not just, they're not just evaluating you. If you interview with a manager that you know is going to be your manager later and you don't like them or don't feel like they will support you, don't work for them. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. It's a real career burner. So you have to have some a manager who actually cares about you, who wants to invest in growing you. So ask them, how do you help your people grow in your department? How do you help your people grow to make be better developers and such? Um, you really want someone who's going to invest in you, basically. Um, work-life balance is a good question to ask and such. Don't feel afraid of it because you, know, you want to know. You want kind of want to know what's your work-life balance. Do they expect you to work 60-hour a week, so they expect you to work more of a 40-hour week and such. It, it's a fair question to ask. Um, will you have opportunities to learn new skills and advance for your career? Uh, you definitely want to see every job as a stepping stone, the next thing you want to do. Not just think about it in terms of your, your it's one job for pay, basically. Think about how it's going to grow your career over time. All right. Uh, do you feel the company's doing something that you can be worth, is worthwhile? That's an important one. Um, if you're going to be in a company for a, a few, several years and giving you the best, you know, your best years of your life, you want to make sure that you care about what they can produce and such. Um, for example, uh, I had a, a chance to go ahead and work for a, a gaming company down, down in uh, Calvaras, and I couldn't do it because it was a gambling company, basically. I was making money and such, and it's willing to work my own personal ethic and such. So I would not have been happy there. If I would have succeeded, I would have felt like I'm doing things wrong and such. So <laughs> make sure it aligns with your mor morality, essentially, or what you care about. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, the job offer is always a fun one too. Um, so, so for a job offer, um, realize that that you don't have to accept that first offer and such is one thing. Um, you want to go ahead and take time to consider it. You're going to be in this job for several years and such. So you want to make sure you think about all the benefits that come with a job. For example, what like about work-life balance? Uh, what's the do you have any flex time? Do they have what's your vacation look like and such? Um, pay is important, of course, but it's not the only thing. What's your benefits like? Um, so make sure you factor everything in when you're looking at a job offer. So don't answer immediately. Take some time to, to, to get some feedback. 
Uh, don't be afraid to ask for more money. Um, we, we expect it, basically. You know, if, if, if you, we offer you a job and you come ahead and post back a, for a little more wiggle room on the, on the salary, we go, we'll say if we can or we can't. Some, usually we can, but sometimes we can't and such. You just go ahead and you say it in such a way that you, you're saying, I'm not declining the offer. I just wanted to say, look, I'd be more happy with an uh, amount was more like this. So, and don't feel bad about it. It happens all the time. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little side note on salary. Um, unfortunately, with salary, companies don't typically do a great job of uh, making sure your salary keep up with the market. Uh, it's one of those those harsh realities of the world and such that sometimes uh, the, the companies that we are doing a salary surveys often enough uh, to go ahead and make sure that the wages are in the right place, or uh, you just happen to be working for a company for many years and you get behind. Let me give you an example so you can understand what I'm meaning. Um, let's say I went to, let's say I got two levels of developers. I've got a, a software engineer one position, say they make 60k. Okay. I got a software engineer two person that makes 80k. Okay. Um, if you come work for me as, as a software engineer one position, let's say you do a great job and we interview and you can start with a 60k number and such. Um, what do you expect to get in terms of raises over the years of the time, over time? You want to have a good guess of what that number one might be like? Thank you. Yeah. Three to five percent is, you know, a typical pool, a typical increase and such. And if you happen to get a promotion, you get, get maybe, maybe between ten, with the promotion and the market increase combined together between 10 to 15 percent, basically. That's what <coughs> a promotion will roughly get you and such, okay? So, as a starting developer, you made 60, okay? You got that, let's say you got 4%, which is a good increase and such, let's say that and such. And so you're gonna be at 62.4, okay? Great. Next year comes along, and that your third year working this company, and they get you up to now, um, you know what, I'm gonna give you a promotion. I'm gonna give you a promotion to the senior, the senior, so there's a software engineer one, a software engineer two. Well, I'm going to give you a great promotion. I'm going to give you that 15, well, let's say it's about like 12%. You know, the 4% plus 8, you know, 12%. Let's say it's right between the numbers and such. Well, you know, that's going to be more like 70, right? But you know, I'm paying 80K for the to, to, to a new hire at that level out in the outside world. That continue, that process continues over years. The more years you work for this company, often you're getting behind over the years and such. That's an unfortunate reality of this, this market and such. Um, so every few years, you need to go ahead and check into, are you still getting paid at market rates? Are you still happy with your salary? Now, there are ways of getting this, this salary to increase and such. You might get an increase within the company itself, or you may have to switch jobs to go ahead and get that increase. But every three years, check your salary and make sure it's you know, at a reasonable number, essentially. Any questions on that? Guys, this is more of an affirmation that that is the case. Uh, yeah. I worked for a company for 10 years, and uh, you know, if you're not getting the higher, higher ones and promoting yourself up through it, mm -hmm. you will start, people start plateauing out, and, and the only way to get a really good raise is either finding a new company or going into a higher position. And even with that, you'll still have a chance of being below market. So knowing your value is one way to protect your value. Yep, absolutely. And realize, well, here's another sad piece of news, too. If it's 80K, by the time you get three years from now, probably it's 80K anymore. It's probably more like 85 or something. It's, it's gone up since the, the last time you looked at these numbers and such. Um, when I started as a developer way back in 94, <coughs> um, I was paying 32. And so that was a pretty good number at the time. Now they make 60 as a starting, so a starting developer. So uh, definitely things change over time. So... So just be aware of that. That's one thing I worry about. And and please don't feel that that's because your manager doesn't like you or is treating you unfairly. No, they just have a certain system that companies follow typically. Typically what will happen is that the manager will get a certain percentage of, of an increase across all their people, basically. So it might be 3 to 5%, like we said, a pool of the salaries of everyone who works for them, basically. And then they can take that pool and they can apply it to their people as they see fit but typically as a percentage increase of their current salaries. So if your salary is really low and you get a percentage increase, it's not as good as if your salary is higher and you get a percentage increase, okay? Um, but that manager still has to work with that person. <coughs> That's all they have to work with. And so they're gonna do their best job to, to, to balance it. 
But if I want to give this person a raise, to, you know, at 8%, I have to reach somebody else's percentage increase by maybe the only 2% increase or whatever else. It's a sad reality of the, the way the system works and such. Now, that's not true for all companies. So I want to make that clear. So this let, a lot of big companies is what they do and such. Um, but, you know, for a private company or smaller companies and such, they often will give raises in a different, different form. They may give raises more frequently and such and such. So, but I just want to make sure that you do keep an eye on, are you getting compensated appropriately over years? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and talk about starting a job. Um, first impressions matter. Probably the, the two most important times at working for a job is those first few weeks and the last few weeks of the job. That's what anyone's going to remember. They're not going to remember in between as much, but they'll remember when you first came in and the when you last came in. So that first impression is very important. Come in a little bit dressed a little bit better than, than the staff. You lose a suit and tie and such, but just a little bit better than normally and such. Um, make sure when you're introduced to people that you learn their names. So repeat their name when they, when they talk to you. So you say, oh, this is Sally, whatever else and such. Okay, well, hey, Sally, nice to meet, nice meet you. And make sure you use that name, get that ingrained over time and such. Ask for an org chart so you know what these people do and how they interact with you and such. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things that, that you need to be careful of, when you're a new hire, one of the things to remember is that we've all been new hires. We've all been kind of clueless. We've all been kind of thrown into this world where we don't know anything and such. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to re-ask the same question because we expect it of you, basically. We expect you to go ahead and need, need that information and such. Um, hopefully they assign you a mentor. If they don't assign you a mentor, I really recommend you ask for a mentor because it's kind of nice to be able to not always have to ask your boss for all these questions, but to ask a peer kind of those questions is kind of a little nicer, okay? Um, uh, do please take advantage of the company's intranet and the internet. Yes, you're, you're open to asking questions. That's always good and such. But if it's a question that's already documented somewhere, it's kind of nice to go ahead and not bother people if you don't have to. But but if you can't find it, then ask. Okay. Also, you want to reflect the fact that you are a learner, someone who learns, a self-learner, basically, someone who can learn on their own and find information. So. All right. So the first thing I'd recommend you do when you're working with your manager is first get a sense of what you're going to be rated on and evaluated on. So an easy way to do this is to take the job description of whatever company you're working for and such and kind of walk through with your manager what these different pieces mean, essentially. What do you expect me to do during this, this job and when I get rated, how are you going to evaluate me, essentially. Very important to know that so that you have any misunderstandings when the, the, the annual review period comes up. Hopefully you're getting feedback all throughout the year, but t a lot of times I see a lot of companies where managers don't get much feedback until the next, the next review period, which is terrible. Um, but it happens. Um, your manager is going to be distracted with a lot of things. Uh, managing you is not their only responsibility. They're managing lots of people, lots of projects, managing up and down. Oft, ironically, managers mostly will spend more of their time managing people above them often than, than their own people, which is very sad. Um, but it's part of life and such. Um, so when you come with them with a, an issue, please give some context. Uh, yes, they may have assigned you this project to go off and work on this and such, but if you all of a sudden start asking a question and they have no sense of what, where you're coming from, they're not going to be able to help you. So they're gonna, you need to give them some context whenever you ask a question. Of, here's, what, here's what I'm asking you and why I'm asking you about this. So, all right. Um, if you have an interest in working in a specific technology area or if you really want a new project or something else, Please tell your manager of that as such, um, because a manager can't, can't always give you the assignment that you want, but if they know you care about something, they're more likely to try to find something along the way. So maybe later on they'll see you like the mobile development. Oh, don't have anything right now, but maybe uh, six months from now I'll have something that can go ahead and sign you that, to do that work and such. So let your manager know uh, if you have an interest in that area. Uh, make sure you tell them about any additional needs you have. If you aren't happy with the salary, be sure to let your manager know that and why. Whenever you have a concern about salary, though, make sure you say why you deserve an increase and such. Um, for example, you might say, look, I've got additional responsibilities that I've been doing and such now and such, and so therefore it seems more appropriate that I have a higher salary. Or the market has gone up since, since we last had our talk and such, and so that's another reason to go ahead and have an, an increase could be along those lines and such. So make sure you're just not asking for more money for save more money. Give them reasons why, essentially, as well. 
Um, but this is also let your manager know if you need any help resolving conflicts, of course, obviously. But also training. If, if you feel like you're, you're missing out on some, some knowledge that everyone else has, feel free to tell your manager, oh, I can give you some training in this area and such, so they know to go ahead and help you in that. that. Um, basically, don't expect your manager to be able to read your minds, is what it really boils down to. They aren't mind readers. They, aren't readers. they were typically a developer who happened to care and got put into management. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds cynical and such, but it's true. I mean, so often people who actually care about process or care about making other people successful go into management later on and such. And it's a good reason to get into management. I'll cover that more in a, a later, uh, especially the reasons why not to go into management. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, realizing that you're not perfect. Um, yes, let me trust you. Trust me. If you're in web development, you will make a mistake at some point or any development. You'll make a mistake somewhere. You're human and such. It'll be a mistake. It'll get missed by QA. It'll get to live, and everyone will be up in flames, and everything will be a oh, disaster. So it's okay. That's part of life. Um, software, that's what happens in software companies and such. We do our best. We do our best to do, do things efficiently and such. And whenever you have a, something go wrong like that, what's most important is to learn from it. You learn from it, and then you show that, that you're willing to, one, notify your manager as soon as possible that something went wrong so, so they can uh, deal with it and such, and make recommendations for how to fix it, and then make recommendations for how to avoid it in the future. And, you know, actually having something go wrong and then you handling it well is actually more, can reflect really well, well upon you, essentially, because people will make mistakes. I can guarantee you that you'll have something that goes, goes really haywire. Um, when it comes to communication, um, there is, there is nothing as good as face-to-face -face communication. Uh, for most things, you want to talk to someone in person. Uh, there, yes, I can go ahead and chat on IM, yes, I can send emails and whatever else, but if it's something sensitive, something that's important, you really want to talk to the person. Um, I've had a lot of mis misunderstandings through email, uh, especially in terms of tone, especially in terms of uh, some reading something into it that wasn't there and such. Um, email is great for like documenting for future, basically, uh, or in a wiki or in a confluence. That's good about putting things in that a shared documenting a shared understanding for later reference and such. It's not good for getting to that understanding. So try to do more face to face. Try to do, if you're a remote team, try to do like Skype or whatever, whatever tool you like to use and such. But getting more of that face to face interaction still matters in this digital age. Um, if you really want to make a bad impression on a company or on your peers, be late to meetings. Um, let people know that you're not, not as important to them. Uh, you, know, you know, you guys are not as important as the, who I'm talking to now or whoever. But that's, that really makes them happy and such. So, d don't be late to meetings and such. It's it's, it's disrespectful and people don't like it. Um, yeah, uh, just doing what you're told. Um, if I tell you to go off and do something and you do it, then you're meeting my expectations. So, do you want to meet expectations when I get to do my review next? Hopefully not. Hopefully you want to exceed expectations. Hopefully you want to do better than expected, basically. And to be able to do that, what you're looking for is new opportunities to either learn new technologies or find new ways of helping the company succeed or find Revise the process, work beyond just what you're told to do and such. I mean, yes, when you're a new developer right off the bat, we're going to, we're going to script a lot of this stuff for you. But we want to see you grow to a point where you're more self-motivated, so self-directed and such. I don't want to be micromanaging a senior developer and such. I want to be able to say, go off and do, and, and I know it's taken care of that. And they're also looking for future opportunities as well while they're doing that work. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Uh, yeah, your first job, you're likely going to get evaluated on your technical skills mostly. You know, it's your first job, or look at your coding style guides. Can you follow our guidelines? Can you follow our standards of practice? Do you do good check-ins? Uh, uh, do you go and put comments on your, in your code or comments on your, uh, your check-ins as well and such? All the things that typically, can you follow our processes and can you create some useful software and such? And that's the first years, that's what we're looking for and such. But to get up to those the further years, it's more about your soft skills. Can you make a team more effective? Can you actually influence others? Can you actually set a good direct technical direction and such? So we look for more of those soft skills over time and such. So your hard skills, yeah, it'll still be important throughout your career, but the softer ones become more and more important as you advance. Make sense? All right. Ah, the management path. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, think carefully before going this route. Um, 
There's very few people I recommend to go into management. Um, I've I've trained at managers. I've been a director in charge of managers before and found people I thought were good at doing it and such. Um, the, the good reasons for getting into management is if you, like I said, you care about people, you care about processes, you like, you get your enjoyment out of not by your own success, what you're coding and such, but you get success out of seeing the team be successful or seeing others um, get past their problems and such. And that's a good reason to get into management. You care about those people and whatever else and such. Um, but it is not necessarily uh, the only path to going up in, this, in the career matrix, basically. You don't have to go ahead and take a uh, management track. There is also every company technical track as well, too. And often managers, if you care about pay, for example, often managers are working, having people work for them that make more than they do, essentially. Uh, and so it's, it's really all about if you really care about those people's skills and such, if it's really what you want to do. Um, Yes, I will recognize the fact that if you ever want to be a CTO, if you ever want to be the VP of technology, you will have to be a manager. That's a really rotten reason to become a manager, to be honest and such. Um, I've had a, I've had, a, had, a, had a one of my managers who was that way and such. And it, it just is a different perspective. I mean, it, you should really be in it for, for growing your people. You really care about folks and such. Don't get into it more so for the whole of being a CTO someday. So, um, and it's also kind of demoralizing, too, as a manager. And it, so one of the things you, you you spent all these years getting these technical skills together and spent you know you spent maybe uh, you went to four year college or two year co school and such you, know, <coughs> you worked as a, as a developer you worked as a lead developer and instead of going towards an architect path you decided to go up during to take a manager job because someone tapped into a solo said we need somebody that does that do this for me well okay I'll fill in for now that's I don't know how to get you I'll fill in for now and then they'll fill in for now okay so. Um, and yeah, it's great. Um, but the problem is, is that over time, technical skills go down. If you're not, if you're not spending your whole time coding and such, and keeping up your skills and such in, in development, it's harder and harder to go back to coding and such. It's harder and harder to keep up with the people that have been doing coding all the time and such. And so you're, you're kind of you're getting towards a magic path, and it'll stay that way if you stay on this path for long. For long. So I really. I recommend people really think about is this really what you want to do with their career? It's rewarding, don't get me wrong. I, I really love my people, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it and such, but it's only appropriate for a certain set of people who really that's what they want to do with their lives. So all right. Okay, so we talked about having a job, working with your manager. Um, one of the things I'll talk about is uh, leaving a job then. Um, what's a, a good reason to leave a job? Um, if, if you see an opportunity to work in new technologies or see an opportunity to expand your role or whatever else, these are, these are good reasons to leave a job and such. Um, bad reasons to leave a job? I don't like that person. I don't like working with that person or that person. Uh, one of the funny things about jumping from jobs to jobs you know, you, you'll find that same person at a different company with a different name, basically. Um, it's just the way it goes. Uh, so you do want to get to this point where you're good at working with all people and such. Yes, I don't want you to stay in a hostile environment. Don't get me wrong and such. But you really want to look for there's a more positive reason to be moving out than a negative reason to be leaving, basically. Does that make sense? Um, and you should always be looking, like I said, making sure that advances your career where you want to be and such. That next job has to be giving you something that you don't have here. Okay? Uh, Whether to tell your manager or not that you're leaving. Um, for the most part, I say no. Uh, just because it makes the manager's job a little bit of a hell, basically. Because, <laughs> well, so, one, I can't fill your position until you turn a recognition letter. I can't even put in a requisition for your position until you put recognition letters in. So, I, there's, no, there's nothing that's not going to give me an advantage, basically. I can't advertise for the job. I can't do any recruiting. I can't do anything, essentially. Then when important assignments come up, if you haven't really decided to leave yet or not and such, and i got an important assignment that I have to get done, I'd like to give it to you, but then if I know you're going to be leaving, uh, it's not really responsible for me to give that to you, even though you'd be great and such. And my condition to stay even. Well, but I can't take the risk. So it's usually best not to go ahead and share that information if you have, like I said, if you have a problem with pay, just just talk to your manager about pay and such. Don't talk about you know, I'm going to look at if you don't make a threat. I'm not, if you don't give me a pay, I'm going to throw it Well, that's not going to work well. A lot of companies actually have uh, policies of uh, no counter offers, basically. Uh, they'll say, someone say, they're leaving, we're not going to counter offer. 
I'm just gonna they're gonna go and such because if they don't fail, you'll be happy later, and they'll make kind of the same situation happen next year. So, um, so don't do that. Um, never burn any bridges when you, when you leave companies and such. You will be surprised at how small Portland is. It's a small tech company. I've worked with the same people many times at many different places I've worked at and such. So. You will run into those same people. You do not want to burn any bridges with anyone or any company and such. So, so don't do that and such. Um, give at least two weeks notice because it's still expected. I know it's not required. We can't make you do it and such. But you just it's a good policy. It's good practice. Give them two weeks notice and such. Um, make sure to get contact information of all your people that, that you're working with currently. Um, you'd be surprised at how soon you forget all these people's names and all these phone numbers and everything else and such. So... I have a terrible situation where I actually left a company and all my numbers were in the company phone. I had no one's contact information afterwards. So that's not a good situation to be in. So make sure you get that in advance. And make sure you build that whole LinkedIn uh, connection as well, too, for all your people that you know. Uh, if you ever find yourself between jobs, if for some reason, you know, companies lay off, you know, it, it happens. Uh, I've actually had to lay off several people in my career and such. By the way, the worst experience ever. Um, Yes, firing is terrible. I hate to fire people, but at least that's for a reason. There's a reason why they didn't work out, essentially, for that person, this company, and such. When you lay off somebody, it's not pleasant. Um, basically, you're saying, you're doing great, but gosh, I can do without you, actually. <laughs> so that's just, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for me, it doesn't feel good for the person, and such. So if you're in a situation where you are between jobs, though, it's important to keep a positive attitude. You know, it's just part of life. It happens. Um, and to go ahead and take that time to, to not just take a vacation, not just go off and stand, spend some time in the woods and such. Actually start putting, looking for a job. Start, start going ahead and learning about some new technologies or whatever else. You want to show that, that you are not just going ahead and just, just waiting for the next job to tell you what to do next in this field. You want to show that you care about the field and like advancing your skills or learning something new. Um, so that's a, a good thing to do during your downtime. Um, make sure you tell your friends. Uh, that's a tough one, too. Um, it's really hard to, to admit the fact that you've been laid off and such. I don't know why it's still there, but yeah, it is good to do because your friends will have contacts. You will have people that you will run into and such. And a lot of jobs you, you find not on the job boards. You find it through other people that you worked work with in the past. What questions can I answer for you about things that would be interesting about working in a company or getting a new uh, start in this field? Yes? You mentioned before um, that people should keep their public social media feeds clean. As a manager, yes. do you disregard people who don't have any social media? They don't have LinkedIn, that's important. Okay. The LinkedIn's yeah. the one that's, I don't care about the rest. Okay. I mean, LinkedIn is the one where nowadays all professionals have LinkedIn in our field, basically. So that's the one that's most important. I'm mostly worried about HR looking on your fa Facebook and then saying, oh, I see you're in a drunken rage. I'm not going to pass you on to the manager. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you're talking about being poor form to tell your manager that you're leaving um, without a time frame. Just out of curiosity, with Oregon being an at-will state, mm -hmm. um, you can't. Couldn't someone just be terminated? saying that you can you can be terminated immediately yeah i've actually had a situation once where someone gave me two weeks notice and then hr kind of insisted we got rid of them immediately instead and that was interesting i had had that happen before and that was, that was a different experience i've had before but yeah it's an at-will state they can you can leave anytime you want and they can fire you anytime you want um that's hopefully something that you guys aren't as worried about now back once upon a time the you know, companies you, you, lived, you lived with the company, basically. They took care of you. They did pensions and whole nine yards, and that was my father's day and such. I remember most. Uh, nowadays, you know, a company is a business. That's it. That will employ you, and you want it will be a worthwhile company, whatever else. But, you know, a downturn happens, and they'll lay off a 25% of their staff. I mean, it, it's just part of business. It's not personal at all. They don't have any personal connection, basically, along those lines. So, yeah. Um, a lot of your stuff is just a Mm -hmm. um, I actually appreciate this thing of like playing the long game, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but what, like, where's the trade-off? You're trying to get your first, you know, job in tech. I mean, how picky are you that they can develop it? What if it's just this little company and um, it, I like I would evaluate all my jobs based on whatever offers I'm getting, basically, okay. and. 
if you have bills coming in that you have to take a job, then of course you're going to have to take a job and that you may have other annuals. But I wouldn't necessarily stop the interview process entirely as such. You know, I'd, I'd work at the company and whatever else, but if the company is really not meeting your long term needs, <coughs> don't feel bad about switching a year, basically. Um, yes, I prefer to see on my resumes three years' experience at least on every company in the world. But we all have been in situations where we went to a company and it wasn't what we expected. And so it, it won't be that bad of a thing. Plus, the fact you guys know there's so many more jobs out there versus how many people are applying for them. I mean, it's just insane. So it's a great feeling. Yeah. Does that go for front end and back end? Is there a disparity between kind of where the jobs are, or is it pretty much if you're a developer, you can get a job? Yeah, there's lots of jobs everywhere, basically front end, back end, wherever else. There's, there's more than enough jobs. Um, like, for example, my team that I have now is all front end developers and such, and we've got a separate front end of API team and a separate back end team. And so there's jobs throughout there, um, different stacks and technologies being used in different ones and such, but there's plenty of jobs. <coughs> yeah. I was going to point out that they may, they may have lots of jobs that they want to fill, mm. but they're still going to be discriminatory in making sure that you have the skill set to do that. If you were the last person on the planet, you had a garbage man next to you who was the last person on the planet with you, and you had that your tooth taken care of, you might reconsider doing it yourself. So there is a certain point where they have uh, where they're going to make sure if you don't have the capacity to do the job, bring you on board. It's better to have pay the everybody else over time than it is to bring you on board. Mm -hmm. So you still have to prove yourself in game. Mm -hmm. Just because they're they're in a dire need, mm -hmm. they're not going to put something on board unless they have the capacity to succeed. Yeah. And there are going to be some positions like and I know Intel is a kind of company that really likes degrees. Um, so they do, they look for masters when they need a bachelor's. They look for PhDs when they need a master's type of company and such. Um, hopefully those are the old days. I mean, uh, so there's so many opportunities to uh, different ways of learning nowadays that we don't care as much. Do you have the skills? Can you do the work? That's what we would care about now. So, yeah, questions? Yeah. You said you want to one-up the, the dressing of yeah. the interviewer. What if they wear a suit and tie? <laughs> <laughs> Soon does fine. Okay. You don't need to go about, at, the, at that point. You don't need to go about. It. You might want to consider if you're going to a place where the manager's wearing a suit and tie every day. Though is that where you'll know where to work? But that's a whole nother. That's all personal opinion. There you go. Yeah. I'll make an impression. <laughs> Actually, one of my favorite interviews. I had someone come in and uh, this they. You know, they had a few piercings and whatever else, and then, okay, you know, we don't care, whatever else and such. And they actually asked me in the interview, oh, do you have any policies on how many piercings you can have during well, 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 while you're here and such? And I go, no one's ever asked me that question, but I'm pretty sure no, we don't care. Um, so uh, that was very interesting. So. Yeah, a lot more afterwards. Yeah. What else? Do you have any advice on kind of the, the best... I don't know, languages or technologies to, to know that, as far as making yourself valuable to employers? Yeah, I, I, I'm actually, I'm, it's kind of weird. I, I'm from a C sharp background, C, uh, Microsoft, ASP.NET, whatever background originally and such. Um, but I'm much more geared towards open source technologies now and such. Uh, Angular, um, Python, Django, that's the ones we go to as well, too. Um, uh, Node is great, great uh, server side language and such to learn and such. Um, you're not going to have a really much. If you learn any of these languages, a lot of them are transferable, basically. So, and the if I if see one someone that's done React, for example, yes, they don't know Angular, but I can go ahead and train them up on Angular, essentially. Um, but you don't want to go take and such. Um, if you used SAS and you've never used Less, okay, fine. Between those two, too. So, I mean, it, as long as you get the skills and the and the concepts, you can learn languages pretty easily. Um, what's a good way of proving to your uh, interviewer or employer mm -hmm. that you are capable of making those transitions from languages you don't know? If you actually want to show them that um, in your GitHub, go ahead and do projects all across different languages. And then that way they can just look at the true GitHub industry and see, oh, there's a project that's in Angular, there's a project in the Gap, there's a project with whatever. So it's a good way of doing it. Yeah. How often have you seen uh, employers look at GitHub's? Much more frequently than you would think now. That's become cold, cold calling yep. the candidate. Yep. And actually, when we do our interviews now, we actually will send off a coding exam. If you get past the HR recruiter, 
which I told you it's pretty easy as long as you're nice. <laughs> um, I'm serious about being nice. Trust me, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll kind of put an example. We'll ask you to go ahead and, and submit some to your personal GitHub, and we'll retrieve it from there and such. And so you better understand how to use GitHub. You better have the project there. And uh, we'll actually look at your commit history and make sure that you're doing it, not just one big push, that you're actually doing it as a software team would do it and such. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. What else? Yeah. In regards to a resume, do you recommend only listing skills that you're proficient at or also listing things that you need? I would list both. You might indicate what your level of a understanding is, like basic or intermediate or whatever, by your own judgment. Um, or you just answer questions. As long as you can answer some simple questions based on technology, I'm, I'm okay with it being on the resume. If you can't answer any questions about it, then don't put it on there. It's going to look really bad and such. So uh, I hate to say it. They, they, like I said, the HR folks, like I said, they, it's just check boxes for them. And so it's often good to have more buzzwords than less. Um, but just make sure that you can say why you put it down there. Like I did a project in blank. It may have been six years ago, but I did do a project in that. So. What else? Yeah, another good reason to put it on your GitHub if you're going to list it. Have some things example. That'd be good. Go. Yeah, that's a good policy. Anything else? This is your chance to ask some questions. Crazy thing that I have in my <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. I've had tons of bizarre interviews. So, so. That's good to hear. Actually. What's one you can share without? Uh... Oh, I'll share one with who was actually the interviewer. Was he was uh, kind of interesting. So uh, at one company I worked for, we often would do pair interviews, and so there'd be two interviewers and, and one person, candidate, and such. And uh, typically, it would be a you know, development person and a QA person, basically. And so I was interviewing as a development side, and I was interviewing a developer, and. Um, I, I typically love to have the to figure out how much knowledge this person has. So I'll actually try to train them during the interview about, about something and then have them respond back, you know, here's what I learned and such. And well, that's having a really hard time with this this one developer and he's just missing everything. I'm missing everything. I, I can't have this this kid go off without actually having uh, sorry, I shouldn't say kid, because but he was right out of college, right out of college, very green. And uh I need to give him something, something that can make him feel feel good and such. And so I kept on asking him. So I finally said, "Okay, well, tell me about cookies. What do you know about cookies?" And uh, he couldn't mention anything about cookies. And so she couldn't say anything about it and such. And so I, I, I gave him like a long time to think that through. I'm like, really, you can't think of all anything about cookies and such. And then then my cohort goes. Well, what do you think about cookies? Do you like chocolate chip, vanilla? What's your favorite? <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, I felt bad. <laughs> Actually, he unfortunately was our, our uh, a good person about canceling all the candidates and such. He would stop them from going on the process if he didn't like them. So, did you hire that guy? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was that was pretty bad. So. What else? Yeah. What are like some particularly impressive things you've seen? That yeah, um, seen a lot of good mobile apps actually. Um, the, for a time period there, I was getting lots of candidates from the, um, the app OSU and such that had done amazing mobile projects. Even though I know they don't teach mobile down there, and so it was interesting um, and just real well thought out, well coded and such, um, much farther than I would have done when I was coming out of college and such. And so that was pretty impressive. Um, if you really want to impress, though, on a coding example, for example. Do things like unit tests, for example. If you show that you can really write code that's well broken out following the solid design principles. You guys all know solid design principles? Solid, S-O-L-E, I do. A single responsibility, open closed, Liskov's principle, <sighs> dependency injection, and there's one I always get inversion, uh, no, interface segregation uh, was the other one. So those are all, so you said you make your code in such a way that's easy to maintain over time, basically, that it's very modularized, very focused and such, and has good unit tests, testing features and such. That's what will, will really impress people and such, because often, you get a lot of people who just code to, to get to an answer, basically. They code, um, if they, they see the inputs, they see the outputs, and if it, it, it works, they're, they're happy. Well, that's not good code, because basically we're gonna need to extend that code, we're gonna need to, to work with that code longer at time periods, so just maintain it. I need some that can go ahead and be able to run it some tests across and know that it hasn't, it's not broken anything, essentially. So unit testing is 
having it uh, automated unit tests is a critical part of coding. So hopefully you guys have got to speed up on both those. So. TDD is a good good approach too. If you guys have you guys are all familiar with TDD, test driven development. So you write your tests first and then you write your code. Okay, that's a that's a good approach. If you might want to look that up on that, it's a good technique as well. So. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Feel free to ask any questions and go up there and get. A, feel free to link up with each other before you head out. Uh, take out of me at the boot camp. We're a 15 to 20 week boot camp. If you're interested in learning more about it, please feel free to fill out a survey about your experience with the talk, as well as just let us know you're interested. And uh, we appreciate that any feedback from the students on the talk as well. And you can fill out a survey. So thank you for coming, and uh, thank you. So, uh, thanks so much. Uh, Notice you were mm -hmm. working in healthcare? Yep. I just I left just there uh, about three weeks ago oh, to really? do this. I was a senior data analyst uh, for uh, David Pecos. OK, yeah. cool. So that was pretty interesting. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been working for Brian McGinnis. Do you know him? I do not. OK. He works for Gion, and then OK. Yeah. 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 So cool. Hi, I'm Lonnie. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I want to ask, I didn't want to ask them really, sure. what do you, you know, there are uh -huh. a few women in this class that yes. just came out of mm -hmm. motherhood. Yes. So the resume and Jared, how's it going? Gladwell. It's all okay. about, you know, having well, taken this.